my question is, to what extent, like we in the Carrollton Carrollton facility, did you look at that, or did you actually implement integrate <coughs> integrate data systems, building management systems with LED lighting? Yes, we did. Um, it's it's all all of the lights are individually tied into the building automation system. Uh, what we're experiencing mostly is that we are getting the most efficacy today by having lighting control systems separate from the building automation system and then integrating the two. Um, there are integrating software out there. Uh, in GSA's headquarters building, we happen to use IBIS. Uh, there are, again, there are others out there. This was a result of a competitive procurement. Uh, generally speaking, building automation systems don't optimize lighting as well as lighting systems do today. I don't think that that's going to be the permanent state of affairs, but I think that's roughly where we are today. I don't know if you guys want to add to that. The only thing I would add to that is that is, is you're taking advantage of other data that's in the building where it's coming from the automation system or something, and many of these in some cases aren't connected or can be expensive to do that. Uh, bringing in all relevant information is just critically important. We've seen on the lighting system where they've used that to understand kind of intraday occupancy, right, where are we sort of moving and, and get more into that kind of strategy. But there's a lot of additional metadata that can be included in the building. And we've done stadiums where we're overlaying, you know, who's, you know, the concerts and the, um, uh, the, the football um, uh, periods are there and when they've got to get things down. So all this vertical data can really help to kind of optimize in what's relevant in this. And, of course, lighting is, is a big part of that. I just... Uh add one thing to that. Uh, don't expect the control system to do all of the work. Uh, what we're finding is that there is huge potential energy savings by understanding what you want the default conditions to be, getting the default conditions right, and then giving users override. So for the example that I like to use, you don't actually want an occupancy sensor in your rooms. You want a vacancy sensor. Same device but it's programmed differently, so the only thing it does is turn the lights off. You get people to turn the lights on if they need it. If the machine turns the lights on, people won't turn them off. If the machine doesn't turn the lights on, about 50% of the time, neither will the people because they don't need them. Where we start off in any particular building is, is trying to go to the point of least resistance, right, which is not trying to figure out what you can do at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, right, where, where you're going to, you know, the, the building team is going to say, hey, we don't want to do anything, but really starting in those unoccupied periods. And, and that can be a gold mine to begin with. You're going to find issues that exist that continue on through the rest of the day, um, things running that don't need to be running and so forth. But, I mean, that's at least where we start getting going. And it also motivates the building team. It's like, wow, I didn't know we could do that um, and, and seeing the results. So the, the classic measure that everybody agrees on is BTUs per gross square foot per year. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of that, but it's available for benchmarking. I think once you get, I mean, but it's a very static measure. Uh, it's an annual measure. You don't even have 12 data points. You have one data point for the year. So I agree on uh, the, the issue is interval data. You want to get to interval data, and you want to look at the consumption and see things that don't make sense. Uh, and that is really just, I mean, you start with electricity and then you move to the other energy sources. Yeah, oh, um, just a couple of points of color to that. Um, occupancy versus non-occupancy, absolutely, that's the place to start. We also like startup and shutdown, which might be part of occupied, non-occupied. But just to clarify, um, you may have to start your building up or down differently based on your relationship with your utility and your tariffs, right? But the point is, is that, and this is to your, your point, you shouldn't have unexplained uses of electricity in your building or any other resource, right? Like, this is not, uh, this is not like you're going to find usage and say, aha, that's my thing. But it should be, I understand why the air conditioning was on at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, right? For example, you may have a law firm in your building that's working on a deposition, and they're asking for after hours lighting or cooling, right? But you should be able to point to that and say, oh yeah, that was when they requested the lights to still be on. That's why it, that big peak was not what, what the heck is this, right? That's the difference. Patty. Oh, Bill. Joe, in your experience, you were having multiple
commonality in what buildings you are successful with and which buildings you are not successful with as far as knowing the buildings and implementing what can be done? He has none of the not successful buildings. <laughs> I can well, tell you that already. Well, it's just more a matter of what the, what the percentage is. But, but part of that can actually come, well, the ones that we've been least successful, at least to begin with, is where we couldn't get the property management team on our side, right? And we actually had to go back to the owner, and, and we tried, because, I mean, our, our way that we work is you get another building by how successful you were at the first one. So we'll work with them. You know, we're not trying to yell them. We're not trying to get anybody fired. Um, and, and we know that there's so much that could be done. In this particular case, it took a year to kind of get them on board, but then they're a huge proponent, and they've helped with that particular kind of get us 20 more buildings in Dallas, and that guy's the, the key proponent with this. So at the very beginning, there, there can be a mistrust or not really sure where you're coming from and what you can kind of see, and, and we don't know anything, but we're also trying to give them the respect of what they know, and I think that's been one of the most successful parts. But, but there's a flip side of that, and the flip side, and, and Sean touched on this a little bit, of knowing what's happening at different times. We don't assume that we see a building profile that it needs to run that way. Now, if we see an industrial, we've done lots of them, we're not going to go tell them how to make this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment. But you start to look in areas and say, ah, I don't quite understand this. What do you need to do? Um, but, but if we took the approach of, hey, you must run it that way because somebody made that decision, then I think of a great Virginia building, different than the one I showed up there, that from every day of the summer ran between 1 a.m. and 11 p.m. every day. You know, the owner had no idea, right? They were just going to do it. Tenants weren't complaining. So it's a point of, of working with the local team and getting them on your side. There's so much more you can figure out. And they'll go out and find things themselves. We did this in Maryland with a project um, with some of the state buildings. And boy, once you got the team on board, you couldn't almost turn them off. And, and, that, and that can become very motivating for us and for the local team. Yeah, I, think so. yeah, I, th I think that the... I talked a lot when uh, I was talking about the value of having that sort of central analytics, getting some high-powered people there. Uh, that is a, I would say, a necessary condition, but a not a sufficient condition. The difference between that, I would say, is the difference between getting 80 percent and getting 99 percent is having the local people on board. However, if you don't have the local people on board, your chances of getting 80 percent are zero. And your chances of getting zero are really high. So it is definitely a, the local operator, whoever that is, getting that person on board is absolutely the most critical factor. GSA has half of its buildings are leased from the private sector where we run into the theoretical split incentives. Um, we're not a good case study for uh, the typical landlord-tenant relationship because unlike everybody else's lease, we write the lease and the, and the landlord bids on it. This is not the way the normal lease in a, in a landlord-tenant relationship is developed. What we are doing, though, is we are systematically, all the major leases, we're switching to a net of utilities approach, which uh, changes the split incentives pretty dramatically. Uh, we think that uh, clearly um, the way the typical lease is written in the United States today, in most markets, the split incentive is more theoretical and Whenever I hear somebody talking about it, I think that there's a person trying to find an excuse not to do anything. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that we're wasting money and try, getting somebody's attention with real data makes the split incentive argument uh, disappear. I think. No, we've seen that as well, I think, on this. And you know, if we go back a couple of years, maybe three or four, we'd sit down with an owner and say, hey, I'm all on triple net. Right, so I don't really care. Um, we don't hear that much anymore. And as I identified in, in the presentation, part of that is because of, of investors, of what tenants are writing into their particular leases, but, but we don't hear it e even beyond that particular part because I think they understand that it's just the best way we need to run a building. And, and so it just doesn't come up as much in this particular case. We can do a better job. And, and if you're in a market that's got a, um, a high vacancy level, well, then the tenants have a choice, right? And they can move down the street, and then all of a sudden the owner's in a real bond. 
Uh, just, to, just to add on that, we're seeing similar trends where tenants care a lot more about how they use energy because it, are, it is more of their responsibility. And um, in a lot of cases, the building owner or property manager is not in a position to do well at that today, right? You're, you, you may have meters on your tenants, you may not. You have to walk the building. You have to remember what you wrote down, carry it back to some spreadsheet. Eventually, it's just a, it's a very complicated process. And then ultimately, you end up putting some fudge factor on the other side of it because I don't really know how much you actually used after all. And so um, it, is, it is a space ripe for submetering plus being able to take that submeter data and actually provide your tenant with a viable uh, summary of their energy usage in the building that stands up to sort of, you know, not only the financial audit, but also just, you know, the spirit of the relationship you're trying to have with them. Uh, what I'm interested to find out is whether you have an average cost per square feet for your systems to install. Because what we do is eventually, I'm a building operator, if I have a great idea, I need to present that to the boss. Mm -hmm. How much is it going to cost per square foot? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, they have to look at the whole thing through a lens of other budgets. Yeah. And based on that, it can be cut or it can be advanced. So do you have an average cost? Mm -hmm. of, can you share that with us? Yeah, so, um, it, yeah, the question is, uh, so what's the cost of all this, right? Um, I have budgets too, right? Um, so I, I'm trying to be generalized in my answer here, right? If you want to go the traditional route and have Siemens come in and put wired meters in, um, your meters are going to be uh, five, six thousand dollars each. You're going to have to spend thirty to forty thousand dollars on the, maybe the software or I mean, the whole hardware setup, whatever, right? Um, the trend now is with the wireless meters uh, and something like Aquacore, but obviously there are competitors and as well in our space is um, more like a like one to two thousand a meter, I would say. And we're trying to push. We think that the more we push that price down, the more we um, we create opportunity for ourselves. So we want to innovate on the hardware side too. And then a monthly fee more in the range of let's say like a couple hundred to three hundred dollars a month per building, right? Which can be a lot of money for your budgets, but it's a lot cheaper than. $50,000 or whatever it would cost you to go the more traditional route. So I, I just add one thing. Uh, meters can cost $100 as long as you don't have to hook them directly to the utility. And uh, the price is available. You just, and the difference in accuracy is not meaningful. That's one, one thing I'd like to say. The other thing is that Generally speaking, installing system meters and systems like this, you will get a payback in the same year of installation, generally speaking. There's, I have never seen a case in GSA's inventory where, where we didn't find enough in the first year to pay for all of the installation. Not the wired version, but... We take a, a little bit of a different ap approach on that as we're using existing uh, data that's there, right? And we've got multiple meters that are here in the FEPCO area. And as long as you don't have a really complex, multi-use type facility like a hospital, there's an awful lot. You can see in California mentioned you can get 30 meters or more that are down to very, very low levels. And then taking advantage of the building automation system. So for us, there's no upfront cost whatsoever of going through this. And, and what we're also able to do is because that historical information is already there, I mean, upwards of a couple years, we can already pre-screen your building and show you what you're going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. So part of this is very important of, well, wow, just, you know, somebody's coming in, they can do this, everybody can say they can do different things, but look for somebody that can be able to, you know, come in and show you your building itself with existing data that's, that's already there and give you a sense for what you can already achieve. And that can really help through the overall process. Any other questions? Yeah, I, just, I want to build on that same question, um, but it really, it's, it's about time. You know, once someone decides to go through this process, I mean, how, how long does it take them um, before they can actually see some of this operational data and start to start to make uh, decisions based on it? Three weeks, right? I mean, you can start right at the very beginning. And, that, and that's the whole idea of we're focusing. I'm sure it's the same here where let's focus in the season that we're in. We'll get to the winter when we get to the winter and start working through this because that helps you get the building team on board um, and, and related also to sort of cost with this. That when they start to see that you've got a payback, on, on the cost of our system and in, 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 in services in three months, 
right, on a weather adjusted basis, it's really quite motivating. So you can see them very early. We're not going to pick, hey, let's worry about heat right now. Let's worry about the cooling. Let's worry about the transition. It's now starting to get hot here and how to work in this. It, it's just, I think, you know, a typical way of, of approaching. Um, yeah, uh, this is a, a part of AquaCore's philosophy is we want to get you up and running quickly. So our goal is 30 days from the moment you sign to the moment that data is flowing in to our platform where you can start to make decisions. And we, we're pretty close to that uh, for the most part. More complex buildings take a little bit longer. Um, we can also do Green Button Connect to have you up and running in day one. So uh, it does not take long to start to be able to see things. That will not be what another competitor will say, by the way. This is one of our things, just so you know. They'll have a little bit longer cycle. Any other questions? So I'm wondering about the um, sort of competitive nature of there may already be someone in the building who feels like they've got some expertise and, yeah, we've got lots of problems why we haven't fixed them yet, but, you know, we know what's wrong. And, and how do you sort of frame this up for uh, someone who does have expertise and knowledge about the buildings to uh, sort of make this a little less um, of a front to their expertise. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll take a first shot at that. My, so the question is, um, how do you sort of work with the, I'll, I'll say it slightly differently. How do you work with the building engineer who already knows his building and may view you as a threat to sort of his power in the building, let's say? Um, I, I actually have found that like the, the trend these days is that um, building engineers have bosses, and their bosses are coming to them and saying, I don't want you just to come in and every day and turn everything on and then make sure like you clean up the lobby and then go home at night anymore, right? I want you to have energy projects. I want you to be, you know, I'm going to give you, we hear all the time, like, give, you know, can you, can you, actually one of our customers have asked, can you fudge the data by 10% so it looks like they're doing worse than they're doing and then they'll have to work harder? I mean, there is this like, I want to like push my building engineer to get better. By the way, we said no to that request. Um, but, uh, you know, this idea of, now, now their boss is saying to them, you need to do better, right? And now the building engineer is saying, well, I have no tools to do that, right? I, I have a building automation system that may or may not provide me any kind of a data or insights. I have, no, I have a monthly utility bill. Um, if I'm super smart, I can do like a green button download and try to find my own trends. But they're like, please come help me. Um, we run much less into... Um, I don't want anything to, um, hey, I already bought something else, and you know, how does this compare to what I already have, I would say. So I'm uh, tempted to pass the microphone over to my colleague who does this sort of day in and day out, if you're willing, Joe. <laughs> Hi. Mike Wyatt here. He works in my branch, too. He actually goes into our real-time metering every week and pulls the trend and sends it out to the property management teams and, and lets them look at it. And that's where I would go with this, and it's a time saver. We have these really skilled property managers and their contracted uh, facility manager teams. They know their systems, but they don't have the time to go in there and look at every set point and walk their building and look at every piece of equipment and see if it's what the signal sending is what the equipment's doing. So getting even simple graphs sent to them saves them the time and effort of logging into a system and looking at it. And something more detailed where it's pulling multiple points and saying, if this is open and this is closed and the temperature should be dropping here and it's not, that's something that they could do. And you can say, we know you're smart enough to do this, but we also know that you're not going to do it because you're worried about the cleanliness of the lobby. So getting these messages sent to you gives you a place to start and think about what to do. Um, and then that's having the, the person on board and, and winning them over at the beginning, because otherwise it is a got you, and uh, then it takes a year to get them back over. Thank you. The only thing I was going to say is I don't think we've ever gone to the building. The first thing they did is building an engineer and gave us a big hug when we first walked in, okay? <laughs> okay, so that doesn't really happen. But again, you think about our financial system, we've got to get those next buildings, and, and tapping into the knowledge that they have and the willingness to work is, is critically important. So, I mean, we, we're all emphasizing the same thing here in that case.